No, thanks for having me. No, it's it's uh, I haven't spoken before a, a non scientific uh, audience in a long time, but but there's so much to talk about because uh, the pandemic has. You might have heard about the pandemic, and and it's uh, <laughs> yeah, been, right. uh, quite a deal. Uh, and that infectious diseases are still with us. It's, uh, and the importance of immunology is also you more clear, I think, than it. ever because of the variation Absolutely. in people's responses. Uh, you know, some people get extremely manual activation and, and die, uh, and other people never even notice they've been infected. Although, of course, they're still carriers and they can affect other people. So anyway, you're seeing before you. Uh, I'm gonna mute you and unmute everybody oh. else. I mean, I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna unmute you. Um, oh. You unmute yourself. Everybody's Was I muted? muted. Was I muted? No, you're not muted now. Okay, good. good. Did anyone hear me? You're and... not muted, please mute. Okay, good. So anyway, we're, we, we are seeing right in front of us how different people's are, uh, immune responses are. We are also seeing how effective a good vaccine can be. So I think because I'm, yes, I'm on it, mute. It's tremendously okay, less. I don't, this doesn't actually. You're you're not muted, actually. Um, I'm not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's yeah, anyway. It says, that, okay, I'll hear everybody turn off their cell phones, mute themselves, blindfold. Blindfolds are, are also important and masks. So uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, the immune system is important, um, and uh, let's go through a few slides here. Uh, Nancy, you want to roll roll the slides? Uh. Oh, here we are. Okay, so first slide. All right. Uh, so yeah, so I um, I love twins, uh, but but I also wanted to make this broader, just just because I think there's so much disinformation out there, um, especially related to the pandemic and people getting vaccinated or not getting vaccinated. I, I just I, I I know these are things that are not very uh, apparent to people, or you can do all the research on the internet you want, and you'll you'll probably end up being more confused than ever. Um, and so, I think this was an opportunity to um, help help people understand. And please ask questions whenever it, it, for anything you you want to know that I that I might know. If I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. But anyway, um, we're really in a new era with uh, human studies. But let me let me just take you through uh, the talk here. The next slide, uh, please. So uh, the immune system is central to health. It's, it's really, we see the involvement, not just in vaccines and infectious diseases, but you see it, uh, it's very much a uh, part of the problem in the many kinds of autoimmunity. There, there are dozens and dozens of, types of autoimmunity, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, type 1 diabetes. The list goes on, there are really a lot. Hashimoto's disease. Um, and we don't really have a good handle on these. We have animal models, but the, the models have not been that wonderful. Um, we also know that the immune system is uh, can control cancerous cells. Oh, not this slide, next slide. Go back, go back, please, yeah. Uh, we also know some of the, a, a big revolution that's happening in oncology because uh, uh, some breakthroughs in the last 10 or so years have shown that you can, um, in some cases, use the immune system to kill cancer cancers. And, and people are getting cured of, of some kinds of cancers with what are called checkpoint um, therapies uh, involving antibodies or uh, there's also a, uh, a cell engineered cell therapies uh, that are that are doing uh, really amazing things um, for some people, but not but not all people. Uh, we're seeing more and more that cardiovascular disease uh, has a strong immunological component in terms of inflammation and and other things, and that's that's a really uh, an area that's 
um, going up uh, more and more every day. Uh, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, there's clear involvement of the immune system. We don't know exactly how, how that's all working, but, but it gives promises as we know more that we could do something to help those, uh, those diseases, which right now, you know, there's very little you can do. Uh, wound healing is also involved in the immune system, uh, inflammation of any kind. And then this whole bunch of uh, mystery diseases like chronic fatigue or Lyme disease or fibromyalgia and almost certainly long COVID are uh, something's happening there in terms of the immune system, whether it's a symptom or, or causative, we think it's causative, but, but it's not quite clear yet. The next slide. Uh, and of course, so people know they have an immune system and they're worried about it, especially in the pandemic era. So um, you will you have seen, I'm sure, all these uh, medicines um, like airborne, like like this. I just went to the uh, lo local pharmacy, and there's a whole cabinet here, uh, as you can see, of, of of stuff that claims to boost your immune system. Um, but uh, there's no evidence. There's nothing. This is it's not it's not regulated. So you can. You can make a label about boosting your immune system on almost anything, and, and if it doesn't kill people, uh, you can sell it. And so this is all based on no real science. And what's even insulting to an immunologist is is that Airborne is bragging about this being created by a school teacher. Now, what a school teacher! I've I've all sorts of respect for school teachers, but they're not immunologists, and and they're not. Uh, pharmacists either. And so what the hell is this about? Uh, and then, of course, inevitably, um, since you can, you might as well, you can claim anything. So the next slide just shows that, you know, what I think is the, the logical, um, you know, extension of this is, is you know, where what people are really interested in. So, um, but it's all fake. It's all uh, not real, because it's not backed up by any real studies uh and it's just it's just selling snake oil to people because they want something that will help their immune system they know they have it and 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 they worry about it um but uh but the other thing is and i should insert this here is that if you go into uh almost any clinic even at stanford and say i'm worried about my heart they'll be all over you there are many expensive tests they can do of pop you in an MRI or whatever. Uh, but if you go into a, a clinic and say, I'm worried about my immune system, they'll look at you like you're some kind of nut and, and like, we got nothing. We, we can't, you know, if you're sick, we'll, we'll do something, but the, we have nothing re preventive. And so this is just a crazy situation. You know, I've been in immunology now for 40 years and, and, uh, it's embarrassing that there isn't more uh, there. And, and so that's part of my mission. The last 15 years really has been to, how can we turn this around? How, how can we do something useful in terms of telling people whether or not their immune system is doing well or, or doing not, uh, not well? And, and we know it's very clear that uh, with aging that uh, frequently uh, not everyone, but but most people, as they get older, uh, their immune system function deteriorates, and we would desperately like to help that. And and that's also clear in the pandemic. I just saw the figures where uh, seventy five percent of the people who have died of COVID uh, are over sixty five. So and and that's that's very much also uh, at a smaller scale the experience with flu that the, the people that die of flu are not the young, healthy people. They're typically elderly people whose immune system is just uh, fading away and, and not as uh, good as it was anymore. So finding out more about that, predicting who's going to do well, who isn't going to do well, uh, developing basically a cholesterol test for immune system has been a, a, a major goal of mine for, for years now. Um, and we're getting somewhere. But anyway, uh, I also promised I would give you a short course in immunology, um, and it's complicated, but but it's 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 quite understandable now. And uh, after a lot of work for by a lot of people for years and years, uh, 
And the basic problem your immune system has and any multicellular organism almost has is you just can't out evolve viruses that are replicating every 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes, they can throw off another variant, another mutation. Bacteria are very similar. Uh, then humans replicate every 20 years in a generation. So there's no way that you could outrun uh, in evolutionary terms uh, a virus or, or a bug. It's just not, not going to happen. So what is what do you do? And, and the answer is, in the next slide, is you anticipate every possible type of attack. And so we've got lots of cells, the white blood cells uh, of, of dozens of types of these cells in your blood and, and in your tissues that are constantly looking for uh, pathogens. And, um, and it's a very complicated system. One reason it has been difficult to touch clinically is it's so complicated. But what we're getting, we now have the technology to kind of keep track of things and, and figure out what's what's important uh, and, and what we should be looking at. And twin studies are also a big part of this because then we can see what's the effect of, of environment versus genetics. You know, some of these things are genetic. Some people are just genetically better, uh, have better immune systems than other people. Uh, but then there's also a huge um, environmental component that's that's even more important in many cases. So the next slide. Um, and so, so, um, so these are some of the cells, you might've heard some of these names, uh, uh, T cells, B cells, neutrophils, granulocytes, basophils, um, and they do different things. Um, they, they're very specialized, they, they look different. Uh, they have different tricks for killing off uh, bacteria. There are, um, less specific things uh, in these cells, which, which can detect something, you know, uh, molecules that are common in say bacteria or viruses, and they're geared towards detecting those and, and killing them. Uh, but then there's also a, a really exotic um, aspect of, of uh, immune cells, which are B cells and T cells, which have an enormous diversity. They basically make every possible or millions of possible molecules that can detect at a very, to a very fine extent, um, particular molecules that might come up in a, on a virus or uh, a bacteria. Uh, and that's, that's been a very exotic system. We haven't seen it anywhere else in, in biology. Um, and it's, it's also a system that I work on because of this complexity. On the next slide, I'm trying to, to tell you. Okay, so, so these cells, these white blood cells are, of course, they get all over the place in, in your blood. Um, they're in every drop of blood. You have some white blood cells as well as the red cells. The red cells carry oxygen, it's important, uh, but it's the white cells that are your immune system and, and have all these different cell types. And, uh, and also places they like to hang out like your uh, lymph nodes and thymuses and uh, various stuff. Um, next slide, please. And so, so here's the, the heart of how these uh, B cells and T cells create diversity and, and this just very exotic mechanism uh, whereby uh, normally you start out the, the B cells and T cells start off with this array of different gene pieces. Um, here you can see called uh, V regions. Um, and then um, then they come together in, in random ways. So a particular V region will pair with a particular J region and, then, and uh, next to a, um, a C region. And so, oh, wow, we go back a little bit. Uh, yeah, here. So uh, long story short is you're creating millions of possible combinations of these um, uh, genes that then create millions of possible proteins and that these are on the business end of an antibody and that uh, the cartoon down below shows uh, your basic antibody structure. Uh, and then what happens is these, each cell creates a different combination. Uh, and that's the next slide. Um, and and oh, hmm. one before that, let's see, I think we skipped, oh. I have a next slide then, let's see. Oh, uh-oh, 
I missed uh, I'm missing a slide. Um, anyway, each a, a cell makes this rearrangement of its of its gene for a nanobody or a T cell receptor, and then um, it displays it on the cell surface. And so then when the right antigen or virus uh, antigen comes along, for example, it activates that cell. It connects with the antibody or T cell receptor and, and, and that cell gets activated. Uh, and then it divides. So then it's now, because the, the particular sequence of the antibody or T cell receptor is fixed in the chromosome now, every daughter cell, and there can be thousands of daughter cells from, from one original cell, uh, with that same specificity will uh, uh, will expand. You'll have tons of those cells. And that's that's the heart of the response of, of the B cells and T cells. Um, this just shows actually the T cell method is uh, the way T cells work is different. Antibodies bind things in solution and, and um, uh, intact. T cells are more subtle. They're, they're uh, looking at peptides that are degraded from, come from degraded proteins. And if it's a degraded protein from a virus, it recognizes that this is not something that belongs there. And then it, um, it, that's how it detects it. There's other, other stuff that goes on, but that's, that's the heart of it. And it's much harder for a virus to evade the T cell system than it is the B cell system, but they're very, very complementary um, and, and trigger cells that do different things. Have the next slide. Um, this is just a, a, a glimpse of the uh, enormous diversity and just some simple calculations in talking 10 to the 11th, 10 to the 15th, or even 10 to the 16th or 18th uh, in terms of the number of molecules. And, and there's so many, so many possible molecules that one person can never express all of these. And, and so really, so one person, even twins, will have different combinations. They might be seeing the same antigens because they have the same sort of infectious disease experience, but uh, they actually will have different sequences. It's actually quite hard to find uh, identical uh, sequences, even in identical twins. Uh, you might find one or 2%, but, but again, it's, it's a hugely diverse system. Uh, and, and it's, again, the purpose is so that you have something um, that could bind to any particular virus, even if it's never appeared in evolution before. If it comes from Mars uh, tomorrow and uh, no one's ever seen this before, you still will have T cells and B cells that can recognize that as long as it's a protein-based uh, life form. Um, you've got all of that stuff is there um, because again, you can't, if it's a race, you lose. Uh, with a pathogen. So you've got to preposition it. You've got to have it all, all ready to go um, whenever. And, and of course, many things will not come. And so you, you'll have a lot of uh, waste, but it's a, someone has compared it to the defense industry that you're just, you're spending a lot of money and not always um, uh, going to be using it. So next slide. Um, all right, okay, this is just to illustrate this uh, clonal selection. I'm sorry, I didn't have this earlier, uh, but it's basically the thing is that you have this collection, uh, millions of different B cells and T cells that have different receptors, different uh, specificities, and then some virus comes along and it only binds to a, a small number of, of these lymphocytes uh, that have the right receptor but then that triggers them to expand and, and to amplify your, um, the whole response. And, and so then you make a response, say to the virus that just infected you, uh, and then you, then hopefully you get rid of the virus, it's all, it's all gone, but then it might come back again. So some of these specific B and T cells become what's called memory cells, which are a kind of a long-term quiescent type of cell, but, if the virus comes back again, they can, they're ready to go really very quickly. Um, and we've seen the cells, people that had like a yellow fever vaccine 50 years ago, they will have memory cells for, for that um, still there. Uh, doesn't always work that way, but, but it's it definitely, it's built to last and built because these things come back again. Um, 
And that was the um, one of the earliest um, reports of immunity, though of course no one knew at the time, but was the, the plague of Athens in over 2000 years ago. Uh, it was noticed that people who had survived this plague years earlier uh, were immune. When it came back, those are the people that didn't get sick, that, that they had already experienced this uh, bug, no one exactly knows what it was, but um, it, whatever it was, they had immunity and, and they could, um, it was noticeable that they were not getting sick. And so the word immunity actually comes from a freedom from taxation. Uh, so people just adopted that word um, and, and uh, that's what we that's what we got. Have the next slide, please. Um, so I just thought it'd be cute to, uh, well, I don't know if we'll be able to see this movie. Uh, Nancy, could you click on this and see if anything happens? Uh, that's a, probably not. Yeah, that's a, that's a PDF. Um, well, no, okay. Anyway, it's a, it's a cute movie showing a T cell closing in on a cell that has the right antigen and it gets all excited and moving around and touches the cell and then isn't sure whether it wants to activate and then, then, it, then it activates. And um, uh, so anyway, there, there's, um, it, it's sort of just kind of very dramatic how T cells move around and, and find things that don't belong there. But uh, sorry, this didn't work. Next slide. Right, so, uh, so this gets back to what um, I see as a major problem in modern medicine is the fact that there's no immunology there. That, that's just, uh, it's a black box in the cloud. I made this slide myself, I'm very proud of it. Uh, and what technology do we have? Well, we have something called white blood cell counts, which is still very much a, a thing. It was introduced in World War I. And then a big improvement um, was in 1959, something called complete blood cell counts, where the white blood cells were divided into five groups, one of which is uh, lymphocytes. And, um, but really there are dozens and dozens of different white blood cells. And, and depending on how you count, there, there probably are more like hundreds. So it's a complete um, low resolution view of immunity. In fact, it's, it's pretty useless uh, to say much about immunity. It, it can tell you if you get cancer or some, some things, that's one thing. But then the amazing thing is that, you know, I've been in immunology a long time. And even from 1960 on, basically, the field has exploded um, and has been one of the most happening areas of, of modern biology. And, and uh, one indicator of that is that there have been 18 Nobel Prizes awarded in the field of immunology since 1960. And yet our most up-to-date, um, very poor um, idea of immunity from complete blood cell counts dates from 59. We have not updated this. This, this is just such a crazy situation that I, I feel I really, uh, as I say, I feel embarrassed, but I also feel this is really something we are working on and we are working on and, and we're, I think we're getting close to um, well, we found, we've seen a lot of things. We, we've made various discoveries, but we still, the, the bottom line is going to be to get our cholesterol tests for immune health so that before the next pandemic, you can ask your doctor, can, you know, how's my immune system doing? And they could actually tell you something that's useful. You know, stay inside, don't go outside, but, you know, something like that. Uh, or here, take this drug. We know this drug actually will boost your immune system. It's not like the fake stuff you can buy now, but that's actually something uh, that, that works. And that, that's important. For the next slide, please. So, uh, so why is this situation? I, I think it's partly the immune system is very complicated, but also it's so complicated that we've had to depend on laboratory mice for almost all everything we know in the last 60 years. And it's only now, um, and Sanford has been pushing very hard on this, I've been pushing very hard on this, have we started to get uh, enough human data to understand some things, and particularly things that are not happening in mice, but are specific to humans, 
and that we can look specifically at human diseases. So, uh, so that's, I think this is the evolution of the field. Uh, I've been, it's been very exciting and, and um, we, we really need to be looking directly at humans and human diseases. The, the mouse models uh, help, but they're, they're not the answer in the long term. Uh, and, and we're getting, we're really getting in there uh, in a big way. Partly it was very limited by the technology. There was, you know, 15 years ago, there was almost no good technology to look at human immunity. And most of the things we could do in mice, you can't do in humans. So anyway, it, it, it involved a lot of reorientation and, and, and focus um, that wasn't there at first. And, and people had sort of said, well, humans are so complicated, we, we can't possibly do anything. Uh, and so they didn't. Uh, so anyway, I think we, we uh, have turned that around and we're um, not stopping. So the next slide is, is just bragging a little bit about what we've been able to do. I, I uh, was asked to run this institute at Stanford, uh, combining immunity, transplantation, and infection. That's, that's what ITI stand for. And I decided we really need to focus on human work. And, and to mobilize people at Stanford and other places to you know, develop the tools and uh, do the studies that we need to get this thing off the ground. And, and luckily there's been a lot of support for that. Um, and um, it's just every year there's something new and, and uh, exciting and useful um, that we can do and that's just gonna get better and, and more useful. So next slide, uh, we're still on the basic science side, but, but we're, it's working directly with humans, getting uh, understanding of uh, much more understanding of, of human immunity. And what's really helped also has been our very unique Stanford Human Immune Monitoring Center. It's run by Professor Holden Maker. Uh, and basically it's a one-stop shop to, uh, for all your human immunology needs, and all your latest technologies. Uh, and it's been hugely popular. And, and it was started with philanthropic money and I, and I should, put in a plug for philanthropic money because, you know, these fields, science fields, you know, they're smart people, but they get stuck in all sorts of ways. It's easy to get stuck. You know, you don't really know exactly, you don't know what's gonna work. So you try this and that um, and, uh, and, and you keep hoping it's gonna work, but sometimes it's just never gonna work. So uh, it really has, uh, that's where, philanthropy can make a huge difference because you can bet on something that, that you think is gonna, could work, but it would be rejected for an NIH grant, for example, because they're very risk adverse. They don't wanna do anything that's risky. Or you have a hundred grants and 10 of them are sure things and the rest have some degree of risk. And so they always fund the, the, the least risky things. And, and so that means innovation, it's very hard to get something innovative up and running if it costs money. Uh, and of course, everything costs money. So uh, this is something we, we raised uh, um, $2 million in philanthropic money that, um, that just got this thing going. And then people said, oh, this is, this is great. We need this. And, and so it's attracted over $100 million in, in NIH money and uh, Gates Foundation money because they said, this is, you know, we need, we need a straightforward way in which people can get their human samples analyzed with the absolute best technology. And so that's what this does. And that's why it's uh, been a huge resource. And it, it takes a burden off of the uh, lab work because then you don't have to raise money to buy this technology. You can just send your samples over to uh, Holden and uh, you get you know, fabulous data back. So this, this has powered a lot of important studies and, and is helping to really break through the barrier and fog of, of, uh, of human work and make it, make it much more accessible. So the next slide. Um, so this is just some of the, some of the studies that we've been doing. Uh, one of the oldest studies has been a study of aging um, and, and the effect of aging on the immune system. And we organized this cohort now in 2007. And uh, it was originally, we got a philanthropic money from the Ellison Foundation uh, and then a lot more support from NIH over the years. And basically what it is, is we recruit people, uh, two thirds of them are, are 60 and older and one third are in their twenties 
perfect in every way. Uh, and then we bring them back every year for a flu shot and, and some blood work. And then we analyze what's happening to the immune system with, with aging. And this has been incredibly um, useful. Uh, and also because you can follow the same person for years and years and years as, as they age and as their immune system may or may not change. It turns out it doesn't change all that much. But uh, anyway, so this is giving us a tremendous amount of information about about aging in the immune system and what's going wrong, what's what's not going wrong, how how variable people are. Uh, it's been very 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 productive. Uh, the next slide is uh, our our big twin study, um, and uh, and and why we're so enthusiastic about twins and about uh, when SRI was giving up the twin registry, why we were eagerly uh, took it over, and actually Michelle's done incredible work that. Uh, both getting this um, transfer and also uh, particularly in recruiting uh, new twins. She's, I think, tripled the, the number of twins in the registry to at least 3,000 now. So that's been fantastic. Um, but our, our, one of our biggest papers on twins has, is this one, uh, which came out uh, six or so years ago. And it basically was addressing a question of how much of the immune system that you see in people walking around is due to the genetic uh, variables that people have and how much is due to environmental uh, influences and basically non-genetic things. Uh, and then the surprising result, no one had ever done this before. Um, they all they looked for genetic influences and they found some, but, but it was in isolation. They weren't really looking um, like you can in twins to, to see what about other factors? You know, it's kind of very focused and narrow in that way. So, uh, so basically, what we had from the registry at the time at SRI, we recruited uh, over 200 twins, over you know 105 twin pairs actually, uh, mostly identical, but some not. And and we measured using the immune monitoring uh, facility. We we're able to measure 200 separate. Uh, variables in the immune system, cytokines, cell types, frequencies, uh, flu vaccine response, uh, the, the works as much as we could cram in. And the surprising result was that, in fact, most of the variation uh, was not genetic. Um, only about 20-25% was genetically influenced. That is that identical twins uh, were much closer to each other than random other people. Most of the variables actually were that the twins were no, no closer than random other people. So it really says that, that you know uh, speaks to the immune system being an adaptive system. You you land somewhere on this planet and you're immediately exposed to various uh, environmental influences, infections, and, and whatnot. Um, and your immune system deals with that and it learns from that, and then it then it moves on. Uh, we definitely saw that younger twins had more genetic influence than older twins, which is also consistent with that uh, idea that the older you are, the more exposure you have to the environment and, and to infections, and, and that changes your immune system. And that's, that's right. You know, just like your nervous system, I think it's very analogous. Your nervous system, you, you land somewhere on the planet, and you have to learn this language and you have to eat this food and, and uh, that, that has lots of influences. And of course uh, you, you adapt to that and, and you have this period of, of easy adaption. You know, we know how easily very young children learn languages, but then you get older and you get harder wired and, and you're not gonna learn those languages um, you know, nearly, as, nearly as easily or most people won't. So, um, so this was a big breakthrough. This also was also that, that we showed that how valuable it was to be looking at a lot of things. You know, a lot of uh, science is very focused on, on one thing, one particular thing, uh, and you dig deep in that, and that's been very valuable. But if you're looking at the immune system of humans, you really uh, don't know necessarily what's important. And so it's it's very valuable to just be looking very broadly and to have a facility like the Immune Monitoring Corps uh, to, uh, to do that for you uh, so you don't have to do it yourself. Go to the next slide. And then one of the really interesting things that came out here was uh, we had 16 
identical twins who uh, were discordant for cytomegalovirus. So cytomegalovirus is a big uh, herpes virus that infects about half of the people in the US uh, and many more than that in the developing world, it's more like 90 some percent. So it's a ubiquitous virus. It doesn't seem to hurt you in most cases um, if you have a healthy immune system. Uh, but what was really he amazing here was that we could then look at identical twins and that one had a, a cytomegalovirus infection, uh, which is lifelong. You don't, you don't get rid of these things. Uh, and the other didn't. And, and their immune systems were so different. It, it was really um, amazing. So the virus, it basically remodels your immune system um, for its own purposes. And some of those purposes are, you know, so that you keep that virus. You don't get rid of this virus. It, it's a very tricky virus. And, and then there's a the flip side is that we found in our flu vaccination studies that people who had a cytomegalovirus infection gave better flu responses than um, people that didn't. So it actually, uh, it's a symbiote. It's actually a, a virus that is largely not clinically damaging um, in most cases, but uh, it actually boosts your immune system. So it's, it's helping, it's, it's, it's the ideal virus because it actually uh, helps you fend off other viruses, basically competitors. So, so it's, it's just an amazing um, uh, virus. It's the stupid viruses that kill you. You know, a, a parasite, you know, a parasite that kills its host is just not, not really um, getting with the program there. It's the ideal is you keep the host alive and healthy uh, while you make a lot more of the virus. Um, so anyway, just, just don't trust viruses. They're, they're always up to something. Have the next slide. Oh, I wonder where I'm getting all this, uh, these uh, red marks. I, I didn't, I didn't write these in here. I, I, it wasn't, it wasn't me. I know, well, and it's coming in under the name of Molly Hauser, who was a <laughs> member. So I have yeah. no idea of what's going on. She's, yeah. she's from outer space. <laughs> yeah, well, space debris. Yeah, that's often a problem. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, well, anyway. Uh, that's okay. I, I can see. So, don't pay no attention to those red lines. Red they're, marks they're, they're not. They're not part of the original slide. Uh, so, um, so what? What does this show? This shows why vaccines are good for you. Uh, this is a mortality curve for children in in this case in rural Gambia, uh, but this could be 1900s uh, America or or England or Europe, because there was horrendous, before vaccines, there was horrendous child mortality. Uh, this is the age. So you can see that up to the age of five, 35% uh, of kids were dying. Uh, and it was, and that was in the non-plague years. In the plague years, it was, it was a lot more. Um, and uh, with the vaccine, modern vaccines, the curve is, is basically almost a straight line from 100%. So there's, there, you know, this huge benefit of, of vaccination. Um, so um, if you know anybody that is not getting vaccinated, it's just really dumb. Uh, they've been, uh, and these are the new vaccines are, are safe and, and, and they've been incredibly important in, in almost eliminating child mortality. Um, but used to be every generation, you, you know, people have big families because you figured only half of the 10 kids is gonna make it um, to uh, even be teenagers. So uh, it was a huge thing. I mean, I've, I've, uh, there's an old cemetery here in Redwood City called Union Cemetery. And uh, it goes from 1850 to about 1950. And if you look at the early, the 1800 ones, there are all these family specials where there's like, Head, big headstones for the mom and dad and then they're like half a dozen little headstones for the, the babies that died uh so i mean people forget that that this was this was a huge thing and it was you know probably it's often called one of the most important medical advances uh in the history of medicine is is what vaccines have done um to prevent all the mortality that uh used to happen have the next slide please 
Uh, and so um, uh, we're actually very lucky with the new SARS-CoV-2 vaccines uh, because they're just 90, 90 plus percent effective at, at preventing uh, serious serious disease. It doesn't, it doesn't seem that they necessarily pre prevent infection, uh, but they definitely make your ability to survive the infection way better and, and with much less trouble. So, um, but this has not been the recent history of vaccination. We're very lucky with these vaccines, but there've been lots of vaccine failures over the last 10 or 20 years. People, you know, they, they, done great things with yellow fever, with um, uh, smallpox, with, with measles. Uh, those vaccines have been very, very effective. And the, and the COVID vaccine is also very effective. But there's lots of failures, so lots of trickier um, bugs. Uh, HIV, there have been six or more vaccine trials. Everyone has failed. Uh, tuberculosis really not, you know, um, not working very well at all. Uh, malaria, there's, you know, there's a lot of excitement about a, a, a new vaccine there that, but it's only 30% effective. It's, it's really not, not great. Uh, dengue has also failed. Uh, and influenza, people tell you to get your influenza shot every year and you should, but um, it's not, it's not a, a very good vaccine. And especially for older people, uh, you know, we're lucky to get 20% effectiveness in a good year. Um, and uh, younger people more like 60%, but, but it's just terrible. And partly uh, the industry doesn't make a lot of money on a vaccine, you know, and, and why would they make a vaccine to sell for $50 when they can make a cancer drug that sells for $50,000? I mean, the, the people are looking at the numbers there and they're saying, you know, really, we'd rather make cancer drugs, you know? And so people have gotten out of the business um, and then the business that's left is, is actually not been very good scientifically. Um, and so that's why academics, that's, that's why this is, creates an opportunity for people like me uh, and, and other people in academics, because we, we're seeing that the industry isn't doing anything. We're still using this, the same model uh, the same protocol for making uh, influenza vaccine in chicken eggs has not changed since 1974. Uh, so that tells you just how lame uh, some of these uh, industries, they make money, and, but, but they have no incentive to innovate. So, so it's really good to see these new companies like Moderna and BioNTech come up with these new ideas and push them forward because they, they're willing to take the risk to do something, something completely new. Um, and they're stomping all over these uh, older companies that just really gave up trying to be innovative. Um, have the next slide. So, but in any case, how can we improve this uh, failure rate in terms of vaccination? And so for this, uh, I have I had a really good postdoc, uh, Lisa Wagger, who is now on the faculty at UC Irvine. And we took on a big project to try to develop a new way to test vaccines. And, uh, and the way is with tonsils. And it turns out that uh, hundreds of thousands of tonsillectomies are performed every year in the US. Uh, they used to be for tonsillitis, but now that's not a, a major thing. And mostly now for sleep apnea in both young children and um, adults. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that this is a, this, these are thrown away, that, that these, have, they're basically a lymph node in your mouth um, and mm. with huge numbers of cells and that you can culture them and, and create a sort of uh, a vaccine response in a dish. And so this is what uh, Lisa has done and, and what's working really well uh, and, and gives us a whole new way of, of testing vaccines uh, without relying on animal models, because the animals, uh, mice are extremely vaccine friendly. They, they will do, give you a great response to almost any vaccine you make. And then you, you know, billions of dollars later, you get to humans and you find it doesn't work uh, just because it's different. So, so really uh, we need something like this and um, that's something we're, we're doing a lot of work on. Awesome. Have the next slide. Um, yeah, this just shows that we get 
and after a week or 10 days, you get a nice antibody response, a uh, nice T cell response. Uh, it's all working. It's all, all in vitro. We could also freeze down the cells and thaw them out and work with them. So anyway, this is, um, this is a, a really something new that we've needed uh, to help with these um, you know, tricky, tricky uh, diseases. Have the next slide, please. I think we're getting to the end. Oh, and of course, some of you may be wondering, how's my COVID vaccine working? Well, so we've been looking at that. And uh, the good news is that we are seeing huge T cell responses to the RNA vaccines. And these are some of them, and you don't see the scale very much, but these are much, very robust uh, and more than we've ever seen. Um, and so anyway, that's going uh, some ongoing work. Um, and then the next slide is um, similarly decorated with these, these uh, uh, red streaks, but uh, <laughs> we've also been working uh, on new ways of analyzing T cell responses, because this is one of the more mysterious things that's going on with the vaccination and infection. And it's, again, something that there's just not been any progress in figuring out what a good T cell response is what a, and versus what a bad T cell response is. And I think this tells us some of that story. Uh, and we had to develop a whole new technology to do this. But this is looking at uh, people with uh, tuberculosis infection, which is mostly not uh, obviously harmful in most people. Most people can control, their immune systems can control a tuberculosis infection. Uh, and they never get sick, but a, a fraction, ten or five or ten percent, uh, get seriously ill and will die unless they are uh, treated with antibiotics. Uh, this is a this is a, a bacteria. Uh, so um, we invented this way of looking very broadly at, at thousands and thousands of T cell responses at one time, and. Uh, we applied this to this cohort from uh, Cape Town, South Africa, of a collaborator, and uh, half of the people developed serious TB disease within the two years of the study, and half didn't. So we looked at those, we looked at all their T cells, and, uh, and reduced the thousands, tens of thousands of T cell receptor sequences to 3,000 groups that correlate with a particular specificity. And what we could see is that mostly they shared a lot of, almost all the T cell responses were shared. Uh, but then we looked at the people controlling the disease and there were a few that were not shared with the people getting sick. So these are people getting sick. These are the people controlling the disease. And then we look over here and now we look, we see a lot of T cells for the people getting sick and very few of those same T cells are in the ones that are not getting sick. So there's this clear dichotomy. It's a clear, um, uh, you don't want to mess with these T cell specificities. It's these, these are the important ones. And uh, it made me uh, think way back when, um, when I was um, a teenager, one day I decided to be a magician and that I would learn uh, to be uh, to learn magic, and so I got a lot of books out of the library on magic to figure out what it was. And and um, it turns out you really can't learn magic from books. I I, I think that that's um, not that didn't really work. But what every book said was the importance of distraction. So if you're performing a magic trick, the key thing is to distract your audience from the important thing, you know, the important part of the trick, because they're, they, they're not supposed to know that. Um, so this is exactly that strategy. That's a pathogen wants to distract your immune system. It wants to push it in every direction, but the, whatever is important. It has no interest in you getting rid of it, you know? So, uh, so that's been a huge challenge in, in the vaccine work is that we just haven't had a way of figuring out what T cell specificities are important. But this is the answer. These are the ones that, the ones over here on the upper right. That's, those are the important T cells. Everything else is a distraction. Everything else is worthless. And it's all about the pathogen 
trying to confuse you and trying to distract you from, from what it's trying to do. So this is, uh, I think, a really important principle, and we're seeing it in other things as well. Um, and then, of course, the next slide, I think we have our, yeah, this is a thing we're still finishing, but uh, now we're analyzing 200 million T cell receptor sequences for the, a COVID study. And uh, just a, a snippet here is just uh, the next slide just shows that one of the things that we've we figured out is that people that are doing well clinically with mild symptoms uh, have a much stronger and more diverse T cell responses. They, they, and I think that's a critical thing is that you have a lot of different ways of, of uh, detecting the virus, whereas people that are doing poorly uh, have, have fewer ways. And that, that probably is really uh, has a lot to do with why they're more sick versus less sick. Have the next slide. Uh, I think we're almost there. Um, and then uh, the other big, big problem in medicine and related to the immune system is autoimmunity. And um, the uh, whole field of autoimmunity has had trouble really focusing on and finding out what's critically important. There's been advances, but, but it's been very murky what the uh, most important things are. Again, it involves T cells. And so it's just automatically more confusing and more complex and requires people, you know, and a lot of people uh, working hard at this. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're starting this initiative at Stanford to bring together the whole community because the different autoimmune clinics, there's a there's an autoimmune clinic in uh, gastroenterology, there's an autoimmune clinic in rheumatology, there's another one in endocrinology for diabetes. I mean, they're all scattered in different domains of a, a medical school, and every medical school is like this. Uh, and, and so it's very difficult to get them to talk to each other and, and to um, synergize. And, uh, and I think we've got all these new tools, uh, and we're very active in this area and, and finding important things uh, and we want to share that. We want to also just create a, a, a more unified community uh, so that we can make more progress and, and, and faster um, in, in these important. And there are there's so many different areas of autoimmunity and, and needs, uh, it really needs some important work uh, to be done here. Uh, next slide. So, right. So we're at the end. Um, and uh, just to summarize it, that we have um, really now, we, we've spent the last 15 years mostly working on tools, developing new tools and inventing new ways to see things, to look at things in humans and focusing on humans and, and both healthy humans and, and humans with these uh, various diseases that, we, that involve the immune system. Uh, I didn't talk about some of these things. There's some things that are very technical and I, I won't drag you through that. But, um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's been very encouraging. And I think we're really closing in on getting, you know, filling this black box of immunology and medicine uh, with, with colors, with, <laughs> with useful information, with, with uh, assays that we could do that, that would help people understand uh, how their immune system is doing. Uh, and of course, the twin registry is going to be a big part of that. Um, but there's just so much to do, and and um, and it's it's this we're at this pivot point where uh, we really can, uh, uh, I think, make progress very rapidly. You know, it takes a long time to develop systems, to develop tools, to know how to use those tools, what they can and can't do. But we're at this point where now we can apply these tools in, in a big way. And, and the pandemic has actually helped that because that's also shown the importance of uh, in-depth immunology. There's a lot of people now uh, finally thinking of that and, and working with that. Uh, a flood of information, uh, very relevant to human immunity, very relevant to infection. Uh, so things are, things are looking up. Uh, I think organoids are a really important uh, new tool to look at uh, both immune system responses, vaccine responses, but also in general, um, uh, the ability to look at a functioning uh, immune organ in a dish is uh, hugely enabling for um, figuring mm -hmm. stuff out. Um, and then I think uh, 
I think that's the end. That's it. Oh, oh there was an acknowledgement slide, but uh, anyway. Oh, sorry. Wait a minute. Oh, I'll put it back on. I okay, yeah. Help. Could you? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got to have the acknowledgements. My goodness. That yeah. would be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here we okay. are. I'm there sorry. we go. That there we go. Time. Okay. Oh, there they are. All right. All right. Well, there are many more people involved in this, but, but I, this, this and, this yeah. what we got and and Michelle, thanks for connecting us. Um, and um, you know, it's it's been a it's been a great ride. I mean, I think science is a funny business, and you you start off, you know, you're we're only interested in things we don't understand, and so there's a sort of a natural cloud of confusion and and our job is to try to see through that cloud and and find things that are important and relevant and this takes a team nobody does this by themselves anymore um and it takes a really uh dedicated team of people uh doing various the various jobs that are that are important I'm also very proud of our um our slogan for the Immune Monitoring Core uh, Center, which is immunology for the people. Someone asked me if I was from Berkeley uh, one time. <laughs> but uh, no, but I just like, I like the idea. I like the idea that, that, you know, here we are, we're focused on people, that people are, you know, are us and, and that the needs work. As I said, you know, there's just, it's, uh, uh, there's been a desert of, human immunology for years and it just it just shouldn't be that way and, um, but anyway uh thank you for your attention and uh, happy to answer any questions so let me look into the chat here you ah. are all welcome to unmute yourselves uh, yeah. because um we can now um where's my chat uh, yeah. <laughs> um I didn't see anything in the chat. There's not okay. anything in the chat. So I would like oh. to uh, encourage you to ask questions and just jump in. Make sure, sure you're off mute. I'd like to ask a question. There was something that was um, very mysterious that you said, well, a lot of things. But um, with identical twins, you were saying that, um, and it sounded like this was at birth uh, rather than epigenetic. Um, but that there was a difference in the immune system, even though they're identical twins um, in yeah. the beginning, or something with the proteins. I, and I wondered if you could tell us a little more about that. Yeah, so this is a, a curious thing. You know, I think uh, there are two things. One is that identical twins are actually not identical. There, there are small variations in their <laughs> genome. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to, I have to tell you this, but but there, there are people <laughs> sequence okay. genomes and they see, oh, there's these little little things have changed. And so you're not exactly, you're mostly identical, but you're not actually really identical. But uh, uh, in general, that that means that you will be very, very similar, especially early on in your immune system. Uh, and then later on, when you get different diseases, you, the, the immune systems will start to diverge, the, the environments will, you'll, you're not living together anymore, uh, and so forth. But, but, but what is also true that, that your question really uh, gets at, uh, and I did, I did hint at this, uh, when you talk about your antibody sequences and your T cell receptor sequences, which are generating this huge diversity relatively randomly. Uh, what that means though is, it, and I did say this, is that if you look at sequences of those uh, genes, uh, they're not the same between identical twins because it's a random process that, mm -hmm. that happens. Uh, now, because especially when you're living together, you're gonna be seeing the same microbes, you're gonna be getting the same colds and and flu and whatnot, uh, your immune systems will be similar in what they're recognizing, uh, but the sequences will, will not be the same. And that has important implications because what we're seeing, especially with T cells, is that there's significant cross-reactivity um, between a particular T cell receptor will be directed at, say, a flu antigen, all right? 
but it won't just see a flu antigen. It'll see some similar antigens from another bug. And, and we've actually documented this in one of, one of our papers. Um, and uh, and it, it seems to be part of an adaptation process. And it also is protective because it, it means you have, yes, you have these T cells against this flu antigen, but they're also good for other things. And, and we saw this very clearly in blood bank uh, samples. So a, a, a huge thing in blood banks was uh, not allowing people infected with HIV to contribute blood. Because of course, then, then this is where a lot of hemophiliacs died because they got HIV through uh, blood donations. And so that was a huge thing. Actually, Ed Engelman at Stanford was the first person who figured this out uh, is head of the blood center there. And he was the first to say, oh, there's something wrong here uh, with the HIV blood and, and we need to exclude this from, and that just saved a, a, a lot of people, but a lot, but it, it was slow to catch on. So anyway, uh, I had a student who um, uh, was looking at T cells in from the blood bank volunteers, and she happened to have a reagent that would identify HIV specific T cells. And she tried this out as part of a, a broader survey. And what was astonishing to us at that time was she saw memory T cells against HIV in blood bank donations. Now, these people had never had HIV. That's, that's very clear. They didn't have HIV, but they had T cells that cross-reacted with HIV. And then we looked and we saw other things. We saw people uh, with other viral diseases where there were good assays for whether they had ever been infected or not. We also saw these memory cells. So, uh, so then the point comes to if you have different sequences, even, even you're making, you're both making a flu response with the same HLA, for example, uh, they're gonna have different cross reactivities. And so that could, be the re that could be a very good reason why identical twins, if one twin has multiple sclerosis, there's only a 30% chance the other twin will. And that's the same with type one diabetes. So there's a, predisposition, but not it's not identical. And, and there can be these other interactions that are probably about cross-reactivity and, and that that's, that's quite different. Uh, so tricky, tricky, <laughs> okay. It's not, it's not a simple system. That keeps me in business, you know, because I just think, well, wow, oh, gosh. <laughs> Who could figure this out? Most people, you know, they say, you know, I, I know that I've diagnosed, uh, in the medical school, a um, immunology avoidance syndrome, uh, which which is, you know, I don't want to hear about immunology. No, please. <laughs> My head hurts. And they tell me about this. So anyway, it's a, it's a real, it's a problem sometimes. But I'm working on it. I'm, I'm making people realize that it's not, not impossible to understand. Just, just is complicated. Other Anybody questions? Else? Anybody yeah. else have a comment? I have a, co a question. Oh. I don't know. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Betty Ed Alberts. Alberts. Yeah. I, I happen to have gone to my doctor today and lo and behold, she said, you need a shingles shot and you need a, uh, you need an influenza shot. And I looked at her and I said, oh, how come <laughs> I, you know, why do I have to have these? And I wondered if there's any simple way you can explain what is going on because I, she said, well, there's a lot of folks that are coming down with shingles and, yeah. uh, and I, I, I happen to know somebody that has shingles, but mm -hmm. I, I wondered if you could uh, uh, simplify what was such yeah. a shock to me. So well, I have one shot in one arm and one shot in the other. <laughs> yeah, you should. No, I mean, uh, actually, the new shingles vaccine, uh, which I think is called Shingrix, I had it. Uh, it's very effective. The old one wasn't as effective, but the, the old, old one was like 50% effective. Uh, the new one is like 90% effective. So you definitely oh. want the, 
the new the yeah, new I, had, I, I got the new one yeah yeah okay yeah. good for you so yeah. so you probably won't get shingles and and i've never had shingles but I know people had it and it's not nice. It's not, it's not a, nice. Not a, it's not nice, but yeah. I, I was very surprised. So is this a sort of a crusade by the immunologists that are trying to get us all now to have, to get a shingle shot? Totally. If we're, if oh, we're yeah, over, can, I'm... <laughs> over a certain age. Yeah. Been well, trying that's for a long time, yeah, really. over 50, over 50, um, yeah. you, you seem to be at risk of, of, um, uh, yeah, and also it's the virus is already there, I think, but then it sort of reactivates, comes out of the neurons. And it's just ugly. Yeah, you don't want you don't want to do that. The flu vaccine, I have um, I've worked with flu vaccine as part of part of our our, our major vaccine program. Um, you know, it's just I'm just embarrassed that it's just not a better vaccine. Uh, wow. it, it really is uh, crappy, and and people should have mm -hmm. fixed this a long time ago. But still, it's the only game in town. There is a uh, a souped up version uh, for older people. That's uh, you know a bit you know it's it's better than nothing, and you probably won't get any kind of bad response. I mean, it's a, a safe but ineffective. <laughs> oh great! Uh, <laughs> but, but it's you know it's well. It's, well it's, thank you very much. It won't I... hurt you. It won't hurt you, and yeah. it might help. Uh, and and we could look forward to the day where it's going to be a lot better, but uh, it, it's just been. Is there a placebo response with it? Uh... Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I wouldn't count on placebos to help you with a virus. The virus is a, a serious business and and is a real thing. Um, and but the uh, influenza shot is not the same as our seasonal flu shot. Oh, it is. Yeah, it, no, is, it is. Well, yeah. I already had it, and I told them I've already oh. been, and they gave it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you well, have I, to have them every year. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah it, it no, no, I, but be. I already had had the influenza about a month ago. <laughs> I mean, the I uh, changed the doctors <laughs> if I were you. <laughs> oh no, no, we have. I'd a ask very for good your doctor. money back. No. Yeah. yeah no, I, I, it, I'm not. I'm not concerned about it. That doesn't. That doesn't sound right. there are questions in the chat. <laughs> if you yeah, want to. there are a bunch now yeah oh are there okay thank you okay jerry's asked some questions yes jerry i think you answered a lot of that did, did jerry if you want to ask more um i think he answered you yeah okay um jerry you're on mute ah will mrna vaccine technology be used to develop influenza vaccines in the future yes uh yeah. well they've already been used actually um before the pandemic i saw a talk by uh somebody from moderna and they had a flu vaccine in the rna format yeah and they had done a phase two trial um and but the problem was they were hoping that this would be more effective than the seasonal flu uh and it wasn't it was it was the same so, um, so the RNA vaccines are not necessarily the answer to everything. The one advantage they have is you can make them much more quickly. And that's important for flu because these waves of different flu strains come through every year and they're not the same every year. And so it's a big deal that in, I think January of every year, they look to see what strains are prevalent in, in parts of the world that tend to get over to the US. And then they have those strains put and the, and the current vaccine has four different strains in it. Um, and so they, um, and they, about one out of three times they guess wrong. Uh, and because they've got to do this so far in advance, because they it needs time to manufacture, to get the strains around, validate them and and there's a lot of tedious stuff that goes on and put them in the chicken eggs and then uh grow them up and and so forth uh with rna vaccines when you skip the chicken egg part they don't need chickens to make your rna vaccine and you can do them probably twice as fast so they could look uh much closer to the flu season which is uh winter basically um and and probably 
do much better because when they get it wrong, it's a disaster, especially for older people that then the vaccine is almost useless um, and, and a lot more people get sick. Um, so anyway, so that it, it'll improve vaccines generally, but unfortunately it doesn't seem to be uh, a magic a magic bullet for at least flu. flu. Flu is much trickier than coronavirus, by the way, because you have the animal reservoirs because their pigs uh, particularly get flu and then, then their mutations come out of that. Uh, pigs and some other animals, I forget which ones, okay. uh, a lot of pigs. And, and so anytime you have a reservoir, uh, like right now, I mean, the problem right now with COVID is we have a reservoir of hundreds of millions of people infected and so they're mutating away and and that's why we're getting these waves of of uh different strains coming through and and the virus is you know very properly in the evolutionary sense uh making itself more infectious and and maybe less at least omicron is less deadly uh but still deadly enough for uh, people that are not vaccinated um, and, um, and maybe the next variant will be even more infectious and hopefully less deadly, but, you know, but then we have to worry about other pandemics. So the big one, the big enchilada, so to speak, is bird flu and, um, bird flu has been around for, for decades and, uh, it has about a 30% mortality, uh, compared to one or 2% now with, with the um, coronavirus, uh, SARS. So if that, you know, the biggest barrier right now to us all dying of bird flu is um, it's not infectious between people. It's not transmitted between people. You basically have to hold the chicken with that's infected and uh, to, to get infected and, and people do and they, they die. Uh, so so that's the big super duper pandemic to end all pandemics that we're just waiting, waiting for the bird flu to mutate. And then, then that's, that's gonna be uh, really bad. So, so that's, that's an argument I would plead, support Tony Fauci, support uh, the very real and, and very serious efforts that are being made to prepare for the next pandemic. And only if we're lucky will the next one be a coronavirus. If it's oh, if it's bird flu or or some of these other things, we're we're in deep trouble. With that cheerful message, you know, what, cheerful. What, does anyone have a a, a better on that note? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all doomed. Yeah, well. Uh, uh, Thank God you're doing what you're doing, Dr. Mark. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm trying. I'm trying. But, and you yeah. have Michelle at your side. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. <laughs> yeah. You have been a wonderful speaker. Uh, you are a technology or a scientist. You could speak to an audience of 5,000 scientists and they would understand what you say. And now you're speaking to a group of ARCS members and we understand what you say. That's so important. And thank you very much. Oh, you my pleasure. Clear and uh, really wonderful. 